Welcome to the Giants Hangout, brought to you by Crestron, as we take a look at the 2024 NFL Draft. I am John Schmelk, joined by former Giants tight end Howard Cross, joined by my colleague Paul Dettino, who's been covering the Giants since the Stone Age. We are with you here talking <laughs> NFL Draft. Howard, let's start with you. After you've seen what the Giants have done in free agency, what do you think of where the roster stands, and where do you think their biggest needs still remain? Well, they did a good job. They're bringing in a hot pass rusher, one of the top pass rushers, you know, that that's going kind of under the radar guy. He's going to be great for the team. He's got a lot of energy. He's quick, got a lot of moves. You know, Thibodeau on one side, him on the other side, that's going to be pretty pretty good. They kind of, you know, uh, address the offensive line, bringing in a couple guards and Runyon, and, 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 and one guy that can play guard and tackle. Yep. Polish. So they, they kind of addressed that. So the need for offensive linemen isn't quite as crazy as it was before. Uh, but still, you can always have depth. You know, the big thing about the Giants last year wasn't the depth. It was no one was healthy. So like whenever when everybody got hurt, everybody got hurt. Uh, so I think they're kind of addressing that. They're going to probably, you know, everybody's talking about quarterback. They're definitely going to need a, a, a X receiver, a guy that's the guy that you're going to go to every time. And this draft's loaded with guys, whether it's the guy out of Washington, if it's the guy out of LSU, the guy out of like it's uh there's another guy I love. Ohio uh, State. Ohio State. Well, I don't I don't count him because I think he's gonna be gone. <laughs> he's he's <laughs> definitely gonna be gone. So and if he's not gone, then we're gonna draft him. So like, you know, I don't care who's there sitting there. If Caleb Williams is there and he's there, that would be a hard, you know, a hard thing to pick from with those two guys sitting on your board because you don't know which guy would be more impactful to your team for the longest period of time. So that that would be interesting to see. Um, I think there are going to be some DBs that 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 the Giants are going to be trying to take a look at also. And I think the cornerback is going to be a thing that the Giants are going to need to address. Um, with Dory Jackson being, you know, basically a free agent almost. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see if they can find a guy that stands on the other side of Banks or if they feel like they got the guy in-house. So that's that's going to be the thing. I think they got I think they do pretty good with safeties. The safeties are pretty pretty strong. Uh another linebacker, a young linebacker in the middle would help out tremendously. Uh and possibly and I I know this does, is not a popular conversation but possibly and probably definitely a tight end because uh unless Waller just comes out and says he's coming back and going to be like the star player forever. Uh <laughs> you know, he, and even if he did how many years does he have? So you're going to need one of those, going to need a player to come in there to help Bellinger out. Paul, why don't you lock in on, on some of the defensive points there Howard made and, and, and try to build on those a little bit of where the Giants stand on that side of the ball. Yeah, well, you know, it's obvious that the, the corner situation is is a bit sketchy right now. We we just don't know exactly who they're going to get to replace those snaps of Adoree Jackson's. They got mm -hmm. some guys in house that they can think about. Could Flat go outside? You know, is Hawkins going to be the answer in year two? Uh, you know, Mills is a safety, but has played some corner. Uh, Darnay Holmes is back. They got a they got a slew of guys in the DB room, but no one's got the proven track record of consistency that they can say, okay, he is our number two corner outside of Deontay Banks. So I understand how it's trepidation there. You just don't know. Um, there are so many corners in this draft. John, you and I have talked about this a lot. Going back to the combine even, there are a lot of corners available here. I'd have to think that sometime within the first two rounds, certainly by round three, the Giants are going to add a corner. And this belies the fact that they even have the chance to maybe add a veteran at some point. You never know. You know, remember when Leon Hall came here right, right before the start of the season a few years back? You could always grab one of those guys, but I think they're going to draft somebody. I think the only other the only other thing that really concerns me a bit is the defensive line depth. I mean, Riley's not proven. Davidson's not proven. These guys have had some flashes, and, and, and they've had some cameos. But can any of us right now sit here and say, we know that they can provide a significant number of snaps if called upon, either because of injury or as part of a rotation? I don't know that we can. So, so I do think that's a little bit more of a higher priority. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I'm a Beavers guy. I know he's coming off an injury, but I think he can help out with depth at linebacker. I think we're sometimes we forget about some of these guys who have been out of the picture for a while. Tamon Fox, 
could also wind up being somebody on the edge who could give the Giants a little bit of depth behind Ojolari and, and obviously Burns and Thibodeau, who were the starters. So I don't know that I have as much uh, trepidation about that spot, but uh, but Howard, Howard has it right. I mean, for me, it's got to be corner and defensive line where I would look for a little bit more surefire depth if I could get it. Yeah, I wonder if that defensive tackle spot will be one they add a little bit later in the free agency process. Remember, they didn't sign Ashawn Robinson last year. Yeah. So either late May or June, if I recall properly, or middle, maybe middle of May after the draft. So maybe that's something they look at again. Obviously, Robinson's not available, but a player similar to that to give some veteran backup on the defensive line. And, and I'll just build uh, on what Howard said about the offensive side of the ball. Because, look, you got to score points. And heading into last year, we talked about the Giants' two best weapons on offense being Saquon Barkley and then potentially Darren Waller. Well, Saquon Barkley isn't here anymore. And Darren Waller, we don't know about him. And they haven't added any other weapons. Devin Singletary's come in. He's a good running back. He's a starting caliber player, but he's not a guy you game plan against like you would against a Saquon Barkley. So I'm with Howard. I think you have to find a playmaker on offense here early in this draft that teams have to worry about. And I think mm -hmm. if you can get that true number one X that Howard's talking about in with that sixth overall pick, whether it's Malik Neighbors, whether it's Roma Dunze, whether it's Marvin Harrison Jr., that's a force multiplier, right? That makes Jalen Hyatt a better player. That makes Wando Robinson a better player. That makes Darius Slayton a better player. That makes whomever your tight end's going to be a better player. It makes your running back better. It makes your, most importantly, and we'll get to this in a second, it makes your quarterback a better player. So I think you really need to add a playmaker at wide receiver. And then I wouldn't have a problem with adding a running back in the middle round to this draft. I think this is not a great running back class in terms of at the top where you're going to have a late first round pick, early second round pick. But once you get to pick 50 and you get into that third and fourth round, you have anywhere from eight to 10 running backs, depending on what your flavor of ice cream is, that can come in and help you and be a part of a running back room. So I wouldn't mind attacking that running back group to go with Gray, go with Singletary, and try to help that room uh, a little bit. All right, let's get to the elephant in the room here, guys. And Howard, you mentioned this briefly in your conversation, in, in your initial answer. And I know where Paul stands, but I'll let him give his spiel too. What's your guys feeling on the idea of addressing quarterback here because of the injuries Daniel has suffered over the last couple of years, and you just are unsure about his health status coming off the ACL? Howard? Well, first off, if you, if you fix the offensive line, you fix Daniel. So he'll be safe. He'll be healthy. It wasn't because he was out there, you know, risking his body or something. He was just getting hit a tremendous amount of times. And the ACL just was just another part of him being hit so much that something else just gave out. So I think that's one thing that's help, healthy and helpful for him. I think also if you're going to look at a quarterback uh, in this draft, I know there are a lot of guys. I, I don't know if you pick quarterback at number six because you're kind of setting the table for, okay, well, this is Daniel's last year. We need him to do X, Y, and Z uh, immediately. So I don't know if that is a helpful thing or, or think if it's like, if you, if you're dead set on one of the top three or four guys, then be dead set. Me, I think a guy like Travis, Travis out of um, uh, Florida state, the guy was a Heisman hopeful coming off of a knee injury. I think you got to look at the guy like that. I think a kid like Rattler out of South Carolina, um, yeah, uh, also that's a enough, good name in the middle rounds, Howard. I like yeah, the rap that, that, that you come that you come down to the to these guys that you know they, these guys are guys that can play. Now a name that may not be popular to to a lot of people, but you know Penix might slide to the second or third round. If he's down the third round, then you know you got to Michael Penix is a really decent player. I don't think people realize how good he really is uh, because he you know you only got to see Washington when they got into the playoffs and made it to the the championship, but. For the rest of the year, the kid was like lights out the entire year. So I don't know if people realize how good he is as well. So there are two or three guys that I'm thinking about because I'm not trying to take a guy in the first. Definitely not. Paul? Yeah, I'm with you, Howard. You know, I don't see quarterback as a priority here. I think Drew Locke with the tutelage of, of Coach Brian Dable, who has been a quarterback guru his whole career, Drew Locke gives you a little bit of an insurance policy behind Daniel Jones if something should happen. Uh, he's got some experience. He certainly has some tools, was highly thought of uh, when he came out of uh, college. And, and I think that Dable deserves a shot to work with him because of his own credentials. Uh, and then as far as the third quarterback is, is concerned, I've been saying since the combine and Spencer Rattler, to me, 
would be the great fallback option uh, in the fourth round. And I think he could be there. All right. He's a little short. That's his biggest issue for me is his size. But I like a lot about his professional instincts, his skill set, his demeanor. I like a lot about him. He would be, to me, the next, the, the highest guy on the fallback options. Now, the thing about that is if you're going to either keep Tommy DeVito as your third quarterback and you know, don't draft the QB. Or if you draft someone like a Rattler on the beginning of day three, well, you're basically going to tell everybody you're keeping three quarterbacks on your 53-man roster because you're not going to expose a draft choice, even a fourth rounder, to waivers. That's not going to happen. So it would then be the rookie with Jones and with Locke. You're going to have to keep three on your 53. I think Joe Shane may be in a position where he's going to have to do that because I think if if he decides to go with DeVito as the third, all right, he's going to have to probably keep him there because if you wave him to the practice squad, he's not getting through. Tommy DeVito did enough last year that some NFL team, even if they make him their three on their 53, somebody I think is going to claim Tommy DeVito. So that's how I see it. I think Joe Shane may be boxed in to having to keep three quarterbacks on his 53-man roster, no matter who that third quarterback winds up being. And I think, you know, that's a luxury in most cases, but because you're the Giants and your starting quarterback has had an injury history, it may prompt them to have to take that step. Yeah, it might be a necessity, and frankly, it's probably the right move, given what they went through last year at the position. Um, I'll, I'll say two things about this one. I'm with you guys. I don't mind adding. If you think there's a really nice guy that you can develop in, in you know, the middle rounds of this draft and you can bring him in, uh, to, to learn under Brian Dable and, and be an understudy to Daniel. I'm all for that. And, and this is how I've decided to, to explain my thoughts on whether or not you pick a quarterback at six, whether or not you pick a quarterback at six has nothing to do with your Daniel Jones evaluation. It has everything to do with your evaluation of these quarterbacks in the draft, Right. The only way you pick a quarterback at six is if you think they can be a special player. And when I say special player, I don't mean like a good starter. I don't mean a guy that's going to be, you know, an average NFL starter for 10 years. You pick a guy at six or you move up two spots or three spots if you feel that strongly about it. If you think this guy is going to be in that top eight class of superstar quarterbacks that can carry your team. That's the only way you pull a trigger at number six. You don't pull a trigger on a guy at six that, oh, I like. You don't pull a trigger on a guy at six. You think, oh, maybe he'll be a little bit better than Daniel. You pull a trigger on a guy at six because you think he has a chance to be your next Eli Manning. That's why you pull a trigger at six. And that's the only way you're doing for me. The three guys in this draft class that will qualify for me in that position for guys that have a chance to develop into that type of player are Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels. No one else jumps into that group for me. And Daniels is, to me, third in that group. But... I would be under. I would understand if you believe in one of three of those guys being special, and you have the chance to grab them. You grab them because finding a great quarterback is the ultimate equalizer in this league, and is the most important thing on the planet to have if you're an NFL team. So that's how I'm thinking about the the spot at six. If you think the guy's special, I get it. If you don't, pick the special player at a different position that's almost as important. Howard, I saw you shaking your head. I think if it's like if it was me, like if Jalen Daniels was there, the guy won the Heisman. The guy is a incredible athlete, a incredible thrower of the ball. He had two NFL receivers on his team that ran great routes. He has a coach, you know, down there that that's kind of running an NFL style offense. I think that guy is kind of like NFL ready. I think Caleb Williams is an out of the pocket. I'm gonna run around and make plays, guys. And he didn't do a lot in the pocket. So I don't know what's going to happen with him. And then I, you know, I know he's supposed to be the next Patrick Mahomes, but I don't know what's going to happen with him because he, he's not an in the pocket. He, he didn't make enough plays standing up in the pocket. Drake may look good. Looks like a Josh Allen kind of guy. Everybody keeps saying, I uh, saw him have some tough games this year, you know, and I, and I did. And I appreciate, you know, the thing, the kid that the kid that did the best and took the most heat, I thought was was a kid out of LSU. And I hate saying that I'm a Bama guy, but he he he. By, really, by the way, upset first Alabama reference in a draft podcast with Howard. That might have been the longest. That might be a new record. I, I, I could I could have been talking about the Final Four, baby. We're basketball school now. <laughs> 
No, nah, but I, but like, I, I think that, you know, literally, I think he's going to be, Daniels is going to be special. And I don't think people realize how good he's going to be. Um, and they're like trying to make comparisons. What, who is he like? And I said, there's a name that people don't really think about. He kind of reminds me of, of Randall Cunningham. If you want That's to think a great about. name. I love and, that name. And he, he's like, he's, he's fearless. He gets the ball down the field. He's able to make plays off schedule. Uh, and if he's off schedule, you got to keep all, both eyes and everything on him. It's, it's not like he's the Lamar Jackson or anything, but he he's definitely the kind of guy that could be, okay, this is a problem. Like, okay, and, you, and you know you got to figure out how to cover him. John, if I may just add to your point about being all in on a guy because you absolutely, truly believe he's going to be the next franchise quarterback, well, then you owe it to your organization to make that yeah. pick if that's yeah. truly what you all believe in the room. I totally understand that. Just remember this, though. You've really got to be all in because the price to make that move is going to be pretty steep. Yeah, and, look, and, 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 Paul, and by the way, and, and there's also a fifty percent fail rate too. So then yeah. even Correct. if you're all in, you you can still get it wrong. It's not this is not without easy. a doubt, without a doubt. And and I don't think the price is going to be that steep. You're at six at the top three. You're only moving up two spots basically. If if you if one of those guys is your guy. Yeah, but here's the problem, Howard: the law of supply and demand. Yeah. If we if we are to believe the generic thought that there's only three of these guys. Well, then you've got what Denver, the Raiders, the Vikings. You got a bunch of teams that are going to want to make a move up. And the so, Vikings and Broncos, Paul, are so desperate they're going to offer three first round picks. Right. Up. So you have so, to compete with those teams. You're right. That's the problem, Howard. That you know the mm -hmm. price goes up. It's like when there was an automobile shortage during the pandemic, and and all the dealers uh, charged an extra tack on fee because mm -hmm. there was a shortage of cars. That's why the price is going to be exorbitant. So if you are totally in, you're paying an awful lot, and the Giants are a team that needs a lot of quality players. So that is a tremendous trade-off if you're going to make that move. I, I just think that, like I said again, I, I don't think the quarterbacks are like that dynamic outside of Daniels. If it was going to be a Daniels move, then I would be thinking about it. If it's one of the other two guys, I'm just like, mm, not sure. No, all <laughs> fair. All right. Yeah. L let's go to topic two here. Um, Howard, right. let's start with you. Uh, you watch a lot of college football, right? You watch a lot of Notre Dame. You watch a lot of Alabama, obviously. So you get a good, good, good taste of a lot of these different programs. Who are some of the guys in this draft that, that, that you really like that you well, watch this year? You got to like the running back from um, Isaac, I mean, uh, Estime from, from, from uh, Notre Dame, big guy, Love him. big bruiser gets it done. Has some good breakaway speed. Uh, he's not going to, like, wow you with it, but no one really caught him from behind. He, they had good angles on him. If you have an angle, you're going to catch him, but you're not going to just catch him from behind. He's a baby Derrick Henry, so to speak. Another running back that, you know, that I think about that people aren't really paying attention to, but they should be, is the running back out of Louisville. This kid ran a 4 3 3 40. Uh, I watched Isaac Garendo is his name. Yeah, I watched him play against uh, Notre Dame. He was a game changer, uh, a definite, like, oh, no, if you catch him, if he gets on the edge, he's gone. Uh, he ran between the tackles pretty well, which I was surprised at. I didn't think that they would run him between the tackles because he's so fast. And so he's another guy that, you know, out of the two guys you're thinking of, that I'm thinking of are the two guys that I'd be like, hmm, interesting. Somebody needs to pay attention to those guys because if you don't, uh, whoever picks one of those two guys up, they're going to have a good player. And those guys could both be day three picks that, that could be in the mm -hmm. mix in round number four. Paul, give me a couple of names of guys or spots that, that you're keeping an eye on, on this year's draft. Yeah, well, again, I'm assuming it's going to be wide receiver at six. So to go back to what we talked about earlier with corner being a very high need, I'm looking at Kamari Lasseter out of Georgia as a, as a corner for me in the second round. Now, you know, he's versatile. He could play slot. He could play inside. Uh, he is a bit grabby. He is a bit of a gambler, but I like his tool set. Um, he's very good with his vision and his reads. And 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 I I just, to me, he's a quality corner who de absolutely deserves a second round value and the kind of guy who could challenge for a starting job, certainly on this team with the lack of depth that they have at that spot right now. So to me, if I'm really going to throw a pizza party, I'm getting Odunze at six. And I'm getting Lassiter in the second round. I love, 
I love Estime, the running back from Notre Dame in the third, Howard. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna take a back and he's sitting there, because I don't think he's gonna be there in the fourth, I would take him because I want a power back to complement the other guys that I have, a bigger, stronger guy. And yeah. then I'm thinking maybe Rattler in the fourth round. And and if I could walk away with those four guys after those three days, trust me, John, it'll be a meatball palm hero. <laughs> And knowing Paul's track record and getting things he wants in the draft, that's the opposite of what's going to happen. Well, they're all going to be taken. You know yeah, that, because, Yeah, because you always say, all right, I want this guy that's projected in the first round. I'm going to get him in round three. Let's go. <laughs> it's really realistic. That is the Paul DeTito way. Uh, Howard, want to get your take on Brock Bowers. I love getting your take on tight ends. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about Bowers? You've seen a ton of him in the SEC, obviously. Brock Bowers is going to be the next version of, like, like, like almost like Kelsey. He really understands routes. He runs routes really well. He's a better blocker than people really give him credit for uh, with the speed he has, the size he has. And he's a tough kid. Playing in the SEC, you go up against He goes up against Turner uh, from from uh, Alabama, those, those two outside uh, backers slash in rushers. And he's blocking those guys from time to time in the run game. So if this guy can go up against guys like that and, and guys at LSU and Texas A&M, you know, year in and year out, then he's going to be playing. He's playing against NFL talent that, you, that you're going to see on Sunday. So I give him a, a big boost. Uh, and I think whoever picks him up, or, you know, they're going to get a quote unquote uh, double threat player, a player that's, that could be in line blocking for you, which is going to be really shocking to people to see him do that. And then a player that's going to be out on the edge that you can slide out into the slot and it's going to be hard to cover. He runs great routes. He has great hands. He was fearless in college and in college. You know, the contact is a little more unlegislated, let's say, than it will be in the NFL. So if you're not really bearing down on him and putting big hits on him, he's going to be a problem all year long for whoever drafts him. Now, you guys did a great job detailing day two, and our last topic will be what to do with six in terms of actual players, and we'll dive into those you know players we're thinking about there. So I'll throw a couple of other positions out there for day two that I think are interesting. You might ha have a safety go in the top 50 picks in this draft, the top 45 picks, so I think you'll be able to get mm -hmm. a good one around three if you want one, uh, whether it's a Tyler Newbin, a Jaden Hicks. I really like Javon Bullard out of Georgia. Yeah. He's kind of that slot safety combo type of player. Um, mm -hmm. Cam Bullock. Out of USC, he's a little light in the buff, but he's probably the best guy playing the football, and he can grab interceptions, but his tackling is something I honestly worry about, so that's something you have to worry about. I know, you, Howard, you don't want a safety that can't tackle because he's the last line of the fence. I hear you. I'm with you on that. Um, it, if you look at it guard, uh, you got guys like Cooper Beebe, um, Christian Haynes from mm -hmm. UConn. Uh, you got maybe Christian Mahogany if you want to go there from uh, Boston College. So there are some guards in, in rounds two and round three uh, that I think could be interesting selections. And I think we hit most of the spots in terms of potential needs. I guess defensive tackle, if you want a monster, Tavondre Sweat out of Texas, weighed in at 360 uh, at the Combine. If you want a run stuffer next to Dexter Lawrence, looking for more of a pass rusher, a Braden Fisk type out of uh, Florida State, who's kind of a fast, up-the-field, twitchy type of guy. And then you have Michael mm -hmm. Hall from Ohio State who was kind of in that same twitchy up the field pass rushing mode as well. So those are some of the the day two picks. And, you know, they mentioned it. it we're assuming a wide receiver here at six. We're going to have that conversation right now. But if not, if somehow the pick at six is not a wide receiver, guys, this wide receiver class goes 20 deep. It is really, really good. Second round, Roman Wilson, Michigan. Lad McConkey, Georgia. You want a bigger guy, Xavier Leggett. Um, out of South Carolina, Keon Coleman out of Florida State, a guy that Howard's quarterback idea, Jordan Travis, was throwing the ball to over the course of the year. Uh, the Malik, you want out of Texas? Yeah, oh yeah, Aiden Run. Mitchell. He's the bigger guy. He'll probably be gone in the first round. You want about speed? Franklin, John? Dave, you're worthy. Thank you, Paul. You got Troy Franklin out of Oregon. I don't think he's going to get there either. But another good Ryan player, Malachi Thomas. Corley, Western Kentucky. My God, <laughs> the guys. The list goes on I know. and on and I know. on. You can get a good wide receiver in round two and round three in this draft if you want. It is an endless list. It's one of the best, deepest group of wide receivers I've ever seen. So uh, if you don't happen to get a wide receiver at six, you might not get a, a number one X guy in the second round, but you'll get a guy that can certainly help and contribute and be a part of this room. All right, topic number three. What do you do at number six? We kind of already talked about the quarterback part of this. So let's say you're sticking at six. Howard, you mentioned the three wide receivers. Uh, your man, Joel, from Notre Dame is another guy that could be in the mix here just because of the quality of the player that he is. Brock Bowers, we've talked about too. 
Uh, what are your overall thoughts about the players we're talking about here at number six and kind of break down how you rank those wide receivers? There's a tackle slash guard out of Oregon State with a funny name. Uh, Tala S.A. Fuanga. Fuanga. Now, here's a guy that, that some people would say would be a reach if you went to get him. But we're talking about a guy who didn't give up a sack. And no, he was great. His, his, his tape's awesome. He didn't give up a sack his entire career. That would be a guy I would be really researching and paying a lot of attention to because no offense to Evan Neal or anybody on the inside, if he shows up, he's going to be a problem for for, you know, for defenses. That's a guy at six that I know that, you know, it's not sexy, but that's a guy. And the he's pick, also a right tackle, Howard. He's not a guy you'd have to move from the left side to the right side. That's right. The right inside, you solve a couple problems all at once. The other guy that I would talk about, I would take the receiver uh, from LSU. Um Malik Neighbors. Thomas. No, what, what, no, Malik what? Neighbors, Paul. Malik Neighbors. Oh, would, oh, okay. I would definitely take Neighbors out of LSU. Out of the other receivers, I think I hear the term, when I hear this term, it drives me crazy when I hear these other receivers. Great 50-50 balls. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, if he's catching 50-50 balls, he's not open. That means he needs to be open. And he, <laughs> Neighbors gets open. Neighbors blows by guys. Runs great routes, spins guys into the ground, coming off the ball. It's great in man to man. Uh, he he's been great. You know, again, maybe it's the quarterback he was playing with, but the kid is super super talented, and I like him. Now, the kid out of Washington is a bigger guy. He you know he runs good routes. He does a good job, but there's a lot of conversation. I'm starting to hear about you know he's really good in the fifty fifty catch. I'm like, it means he's not open. And I don't like that in college. I like Reese Howard. Be on the neighbor's bandwagon with Schmelke. <laughs> Stick it to Latino. Stick it to him. Paul, I, I, I like guy, I like guys that are open. Don't say 50-50 to me. <laughs> <laughs> this is, folks, you got to realize Howard has some Kenny Galladay P PTSD <laughs> going on here. I, so I, the I, problem I, is I got I love two Gall memories I love of Mexico Gallaudet Burris, really okay, guys? <laughs> All right, Paul. Paul, make the case for Adunze. Well, you know, I, I I saw what Burris did for Eli Manning, and and I just happened to love that big, long receiver who can have a huge box to throw the ball in, uh, can out wrestle people, can out jump people, can be physical, blocks in the run game on the edge, so that five yard run turns into a thirteen yard run. Uh, I you know I'm always going to be partial to to the skyscraper receiver if I can get my hands on him now. Yeah. Of course, he can't be Ramses Barden. And with all due respect to Ramses, he could work well against zone coverage. He had no chance against uh, man coverage because of what Howard said. He couldn't get open. So he was always stuck in the mud. He was strictly a zone coverage type receiver because he just did not have enough escape ability. I think Odunze has enough escape ability, but it's just that his ability to out physical people for a ball with his size and length is so unbelievably great that that's why people tell those things to Howard Cross. Uh, All right, so wait, aggregators, wait, clip wait, wait, that wait, out. Paul Dettino compares Roma Dunze to Ramsey's Barden. That's his draft comp. Absolutely That's what not. I heard. Absolutely <laughs> not. But here's, <laughs> in, in reference to the question, though, John. Listen, look, when you mention Plexico Burst, you're talking about a super talented guy. That's you're, what Dunze is. You're not talking super about. Super talented. Like Plexico ran by guys. And was I understand that. Okay, Adunze is so, very deceptive. And, in his and Plex was not a 50 50 uh, receiver because he was open. Well, <laughs> because of his length and height, which is what Adunze no, has. There was nobody near him. He was open. Right. <laughs> in any event, the point, John, is this we discussed it on BBK a lot. Uh, you look at the Giants situation. If the three premier premier quarterbacks are gone, it's obvious that they're going to have a shot at one of the three premier wide receivers. So to me, you can't go wrong. If Harrison drops, he's got to be the first choice. I still don't think it happens, although it's possible. He would be the only guy that makes me move off Odunze. Odunze is my next guy. And then if that if that's not possible, I'm definitely going to take neighbors. Now, if the Giants decide, as you just said a couple of minutes ago, that this wide receiver class is so good that they feel they can get really good quality at wide receiver, and I'm not sure, you know, that I would, I'd be willing to do it, but if they think so, 
and there are so many big play receivers in this draft, I'd be willing to talk to Minnesota at 11, Denver at 12, and Las Vegas at 13, thinking that, okay, you know what? Let me see if one of those teams still want to go up and get that fourth quarterback. Who might not even be there at six, by the way. That guy might not even be there at six anyway. They might might have already moved up with Arizona or L.A. Could be. Could be. So I have to wait till I'm on the clock. But if I'm on the clock and that fourth quarterback is still on the board and those three teams, Minnesota, Denver, and Las Vegas, are ringing my phone, I'm picking up the phone. I am absolutely seeing at that point, if I got three teams bidding for one quarterback, I should be able to squeeze a lot of juice out of that orange. All right. So my question then talk about it. That's fine. My question for you then, Paul, if you're picking in, let's say the early teens, 13, let's just throw out. Let's let's say you trade down to 13, right? Yeah. What, who are you targeting there? What type of player or position? Because the fourth wide receiver is not, in my opinion, is not good enough to pick that high. I, I wouldn't pick Brian Thomas Jr. in in the top right. 15 myself personally. So where would you go then picking 13? Because remember, all fans are going to care about is that you did not get one of these top three wide receivers. You better walk I away with that. somebody that's going to be a game changer. I know and that. You didn't, get, it, you, didn't I, you didn't get your tackle either. Well, I'm, I'm going to go <laughs> offensive line then. At that point, John, I think there's enough there offensive line-wise that in the middle of the first round – I should be able to have my choice of a few guys. Now, is there I any thought way? you might go corner there or edge, to be honest with you. Or maybe not edge because they, they just got burns. I thought maybe you yeah, might go I, corner I, there. You can't, have enough, you can't have enough great rough pass rushers. We've seen that with the Giants before. That too. Good point. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that there's another pass rusher after you get past Turner. And I know Latu's got the injury history, so it'd be risky for me to take him there too. Uh, do you want to take Verse there? Uh, I don't know. You know me, John. I got this blood about the offensive line, and it's hard for me to go away from it this year. If I traded down that far, ah. So you would pick a tackle? I'm assuming you would pick a tackle there, Well, I'm asking you, is there there any way, Howard, is there any way that I can get Latham to drop to me at 11? Yeah, Yeah. there's a a chance him or Fuango could be there at 11. Like, it's possible for sure. Would you be mad at me, Howard, if I took J.C. Latham? No, I wouldn't be mad at you. It'd be roll tight, you know. You, you you get that, but but the the idea that that, that you got to pick at that pick at six, and then all of a sudden teams are calling you. You kind of have to have a, two or three players already lined up in your mind that you would go to if you were there. Yeah. So that's got to be a plan plan already designed, and we're doing it, you know, whimsical things. You're like, oh yeah, we could do that, but like you really should have like two or three players lined up. Well, yeah, I, it's the three receivers for me. Yeah, it's the so three like, receivers in order. That's the way it is at six. When it gets to six, yeah, but but, but if you're going to trade receivers. out of that spot, you that's when you have to know who you're going to get. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. saying he needs that three players that you definitely want wherever the spot you trade down to. Oh, I, 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 yeah. Well, see, I don't know though at where I'm going. I'm hoping that I can get to eleven. I really don't want to go down lower than that. But I would listen to Vegas at thirteen. Who, who right. are the three players at eleven? Probably for me, it would be Latham first. I think the corner would be second for me, John. I'd, I'd agree with you there. I would certainly go corner. Is there a chance that I might be able to get myself Terry and Arnold? What if you could get Brock Bowers? I don't think I would do it. Really? I would probably, I would probably I, go for oh, Terry. I would do that, man. Would Bowers at 11? Well, Sign me up, baby. <laughs> yeah, you would? How about oh, you, yeah. Howard? Would, 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 would you be good with Bowers at 11? Yes. Game changer. Definitely a game changer. He would hurt the <laughs> NFC East. He would kill it. <laughs> well, you know what? You sold me. He'd be my third choice. How about that? <laughs> okay. All right. I, I want to touch on two more things real quick before we say goodbye. This has been a great conversation. I had a lot of fun. I was always good talking to Paul and Howard. Uh, you mentioned this briefly, Marvin Harrison Jr., Paul. I do think there's an outside chance that he somehow gets there, and this yeah. is the formula. Uh, the three quarterbacks go one through three. Arizona trades out at four, the fourth quarterback, ostensibly J.J. McCarthy, uh, but it could be Drake May and McCarthy or swap three, four, uh, mm-hmm. are gone. And then the Chargers pick at five, and Jim Harbaugh being Jim Harbaugh, I don't pick wide receivers. I want offensive linemen. And he ends up going with Joe Alt there at number five. And then all of a sudden, no wide receivers are off the board, and Marvin Emerson Jr. sitting there at six. So I wouldn't rule it out, 
what I call likely? Absolutely not. Uh, I think you're looking at a you know 10, 15% chance, but it's still a chance. You never know. Yeah. So, so Marvin Harrison Jr. is better than these other two guys that, that, that much better? Um, I don't know. I don't think he's that much better. And that's why I think there's a chance he could drop mm -hmm. there. Um, I, yeah. The way I describe Harrison, and we haven't really talked about him much, he's a 6'3", six, 6'4", six, guy, Howard, that moves like a 6-foot guy. Mm -hmm. And he's able to get open. He can make contested catches if he has to, but he mm -hmm. separates. Uh, you could tell he's learned how to be a good route runner from his dad, man. He gets in mm -hmm. and out of those breaks at 6'3", better than any guy that big that I've seen coming out of the draft. Mm -hmm. he, he never ran. He skipped this whole post-draft process. But I, my understanding that if he did, he'd be a high 4'3's guy, which mm -hmm. is plenty fast. So... Uh, I, you know, he just That's checks all those boxes. He's so polished. He's got great hands. You can't go wrong. He gets Howard's explosive. And this is, he gets Paul's as a skyscraper. He checks all the boxes. Yeah. Everybody wins. Um, and then I'll just touch on Joel very quickly. We haven't really mentioned him much there. And then Olu Fashino, I think, would be another guy. Uh, their left tackles that you would have to move over to the right side, which I think would be something you want to talk about there. Uh, I do think Alt is, is the best offensive tackle in this class. I think. Um, he's a legitimate top five, 10 pick in, in most drafts. I think he's very good. You couldn't go wrong there, but I think long-term when you're talking about team building, I'm hard pressed to find an NFL team in the league right now that are paying big time money to two offensive tackles at the first time. So let at the same time. So let's say you hit on all, you go four years, you know, all setting into his fifth year option. You want to extend them. You're going to be paying Andrew Thomas and Joel over 50 million combined two offensive tackles. That's tough. It's a tough thing to do to build your team that way. So that's why I would ultimately lean wide receiver over tackle when you're talking about that spot at six. Guys, any, that, yeah, Paul, any, any closing comments, Paul? Why don't you go first? No, I think there, there's logic to that. I, I don't. I, that's it now if you take him at six. If you take him a little bit lower, his slot's lower, he gets lower money. Well, and, and the guards will get paid less than tackles too. Right. So that's just how it exactly. goes. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think the one thing that we have to keep in mind here is that Joe Shane, at least my perception of him, he does not believe the Giants are in a, a total rebuild right now. I do believe that he thinks this team is in the middle of a of a of a rebuild, if you will, not at the beginning of one. And so it's very important to him. He kept saying all the time before he made the Brian Burns trade that he had three premium picks, right? He kept saying that in his first 70. So he values draft picks immensely. And I think he also understands that you want to build through the draft first. So for me, with the sixth, with the 47th, and now, you know, he still has that 70th pick. You know, I, I, I think if there's an opportunity for him to even get another one somehow, maybe it's in the second round or the third round, it wouldn't surprise me if he does a little something there. I just don't see him going the other way and trading a whole bunch of picks to move up in the first round. I think that would be my only thought. I, I just, I don't see that in his blood, even though the Bills did that to go get Josh Allen some years ago. All right, Howard, final thoughts. My final thoughts is this. I, I think that, you know, as fans, uh, they should think about uh, they ball and those guys, coach of the year. They were, they were so great year one, but all those games, they won by one game, well, you know, one score games, one score games. They lost the same amount of games this year by one score. So they're not they're not that far away. Now, injuries and a lot of stuff happened to the team that they caused a lot of what was going on. But it's, instead of saying they were getting blown out, they had a bunch of one score games that just didn't go the way they thought. They're trying to fill in the pieces to make sure that first off, they're going to have a healthy team on the field. And that's what we're hoping for for the, for the Giants, especially. And if they can get the guys that can, you know, a, a play a, a big time playmaker at the wide out. If, if you can make sure that the offensive line, you have five offensive line and maybe seven just in case, but five offensive line, they're going to be together for the entire season. You have two pass rushers. If you can get another guy in the middle and a cornerback, you're not. It doesn't make you that far away. So that's what you know. I I look at it as. Hey, look, the year before, what a great season. One score games. We won them. Uh, everybody's excited. Everybody's happy. The Giants go to the playoffs. The year after, one score games take them out. You know, the Jets, the Bills, just short games. If you if you win three or four of those games, all of a sudden you're in the playoffs last year. So that's kind of that's kind of the moment they're in. Uh the, 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 those losses pushed them up to a number six pick. 
So it's going to be interesting to see how, how they choose to use those picks to fill the team that was not that far away. All right, I'll close with this. And this is not the case for every NFL draft, but this is a good year to have a top 10 pick. There mm-hmm. are, in my opinion, more blue chip players in this draft class than you've maybe had in the last two or three draft classes put together. I think that's how good the top of this draft is. I think uh, the talent goes into the second and early third rounds where the Giants have two more picks. I think you should be able to get three starter caliber players with your first three picks in this draft. Now, I do think the talent drops off a lot once you get to day three. Why? A lot of kids went back to school. Howard knows about this. These mm-hmm. kids go back. They got the extra year because of COVID. You have NIL deals and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of these kids that have would have came out and populated the fourth round, the fifth round, the sixth round, they all went back to school. So I think this thing's going to drop off a lot when you get to the later rounds. I think a lot of teams in rounds four will try to package some of those later round picks to move up. I think teams will try to bail out of this draft late in this draft to get into next year's draft, which is going to be much, much deeper because all those kids are running out of the COVID years and all that stuff, and they have to come out um, in next year's draft class. So when you think about the class, I think it's important for fans to put this group into context when you think about it that way. Everybody, thank you for joining us in the Giants Hangout, brought to you by Crestron. I am John Schmelk. Thanks to Paul Dottino and Howard Cross. Enjoy this sprint up to the draft as the Giants try to continue to improve heading into the 2024 season.